you're listening to the Fusion Patrol Podcast. All irregularities will be handled by the forces controlling each dimension. Transuranic heavy elements may not be used where there is life. Medium atomic weights are available. Gold, lead, copper, jet, diamond, radium, sapphire, silver and steel. Sapphire and steel have been assigned. And so begins every episode of the 1979 to 1982 classic cult British science fiction series, Sapphire and Steel. Hello, I'm Eugene. And I'm Ben. And this is Fusion Patrol. And this time we're going to be looking at Sapphire and Steel. And specifically we'll be looking at the first story in Sapphire and Steel. But uh, first, we should probably give you a little background. Oh, by the way. This is not Doctor Who this week. Surprise! It, it's we've been on a bit of a run, but we've uh, we've definitely... can't imagine why. <laughs> but now we're moving on to kind of the other stuff that we want to share with you, that we want to talk to you about, and that's that's stuff that may or may not be obscure, or that you may or may not have heard of, but that shouldn't be forgotten. That these are programs. Well, perhaps some of them should be forgotten in, in some of the cases, but not Sapphire and Steel. So uh, <clears throat> just by way of background, Sapphire and Steel was a program that was uh, put about in about 1979, or at least it first transmitted in 1979, uh, and it was made by ATV, which was one of the uh, production uh, groups in, in Britain at that time that was not the BBC. And it is a bit of a competition to... Uh, Doctor Who, coincidentally, uh, which uh, 1979 was about uh, the peak of the Tom Baker years. Mm, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I think he, he conked out in about 81, didn't he? So, uh, so yeah, that would have been maybe Leela, maybe Earl mm, Romana. Romana, I would think. Early Romana, yeah. So, I mean, Doctor Who was really at its, at its um, zenith uh, in that period of time i think and yeah, sapphire and steel is definitely has some elements that could make you think of it um, basically the the fundamental premise of the show is that sapphire and steel two characters played by joanna lumley who some people best know for her role in that show I can't stand. What is it, Ben? Um, absolutely fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. A show I do not find at all funny. Uh, but uh, I find her more uh, memorable from her role as Purdy in the New Avengers, uh, replacing basically uh, Tara King when they brought that show back. Uh, just a bit before Sapphire and Steel, uh, I believe. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that was in the... Uh, Mid late seventies, and David McCallum, who is all over TV all the time, it seems like, but uh, is probably best remembered as Ilya Kuryakin from The Man from Uncle. The series was uh, created, and five of the six episodes were written by P.J. Hammond, who is a uh, longtime writer of television in Great Britain. He has written a few other programs uh, for ex- that you may have heard of. He's written at least two episodes of Torchwood, the Doctor Who spinoff, uh, an episode which I forget their names, but one of them was about these fairies being real uh, and swarming over and, and killing people, which I, I did watch and I thought was particularly effective, uh, creepy, compared to the rest of the first series of Torchwood, which I didn't care for at all. 
Uh, the two episodes that he wrote were From Out of the Rain and Small Worlds. I'm not exactly sure which one is which. Small Worlds is the one about the fairies. And From Out of the Rain would be the one about the, the film. The film that's, that was had creatures coming out of old celluloid film and doing nasty things to people. Which is actually quite sapphire and steelish. Yes. Um... Uh, uh, according to Hammond, uh, his inspiration for writing Sapphire and Steel came from spending the night in a supposedly haunted house. And I think you'll, you'll get that from the, uh, from the show if you get, it, get an opportunity to watch it. To my knowledge, it's never aired in the United States, but it is available on A&E DVD box set. So um, if you're interested in this program, I, I definitely would... Uh, check it out if you get the opportunity um i'm not going to go into too much about the characters of sapphire and steel or the set up the premise i think we'll just kind of go into the episode because as it happens um i've watched the entire series of sapphire and steel in the past uh but ben is a newbie and so he has not actually seen any more than the first episode correct and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the first episode and what we learn and what we know about Sapphire and Steel because part of the part of the appeal to the show is is the mystery about the characters. So, uh, what was your uh, what was your overall impression of the story? And and it's a six part story, I should point out. So it's it spans roughly three hours, I guess, in total. What I got out of the entire thing for the most part is um, it's a little creepy, but in a very good way. Very, very mysterious. I find the characters to be, I mean, from what little we get out of them, and I mean, we learned very little, at least in the course of the first episode, and I'm, from what I understand throughout the course of the entire series, we really don't learn much about them. Uh, maybe we might learn some of their talents, and they might reveal a little bit about uh, certain missions or jobs that they have had. But other than that, we really don't learn a lot about them personally or, or, or what kind of people they really are. We just get little hints. And in a strange way, that makes them really compelling characters. And it, I just couldn't stop watching this show. It was absolutely amazing. It was the complete antithesis to everything that Doctor Who is. In that, um, even, even though talk, Doctor Who uses a lot of what I call very, very loose science in their science fiction, everything is still explained. In this, they give you very little. Well, this is a ghost story. I mean, yes. it, it, it's it's a it's a ghost story where the ghosts aren't ectoplasmic dead spirits; they are echoes of time, and that's. I guess that we should at least go to the point of saying that the show is set up. The initial part of the episode is that a, a boy is in his home. It's a creepy, spooky old home, and it's a stormy night, and the the leaves are cracking against the the windows and the um, the cl- there's clocks everywhere and they're all ticking and upstairs at the very top of a three or four story house his his parents and his little sister are getting ready for bed and they're doing nursery rhymes and they're all laughing and, and happy and while he's working suddenly the clocks all start to stop and we never we, at the beginning we never ever see the parents just the children and there's noise and all the clocks stop and the parents are gone. And just, and the little girl is so young that she really can't, you know, they're, they're just gone. They're just, just gone. And they're in a very isolated house because to, to have police come out, they have to go into town to make a phone call. And then the policeman has to take a boat to come out from across the bay. I mean, they're, they are, they are totally and utterly isolated uh, in this in this spooky, creepy house. And instead of the police showing up, these two people, Sapphire and Steel, 
show up and basically come in and start bossing the boy around and say, no, I canceled calling the police. You don't need them. They can't help you with this problem. You want your parents back, right? Then work with us. And of course, much of the episode involves the boy really not being particularly uh, trusting. I mean, he doesn't really have much choice, but he's conflicted between what he thinks he ought to do and how he ought to help his parents. And these two very strange people uh, that can do very strange things. Um, they can they can telepathically communicate to each other. Um, we see that that steel can lower his body temperature to near absolute zero. That sapphire can do the ability to run time backwards in small increments. And it, it's kind of interesting when I watch the show because at some point we get a a kind of descript they kind of give us a description of what's going on they say well you know time is this sort of big they don't quite say timey wimey wibbly wobbly but you know time is this big tunnel and that stretches forever and it infuses us and it runs around us and when you have a lot of old things you can like in this house, which is an old house with lots of clocks and lots of Lots antiques, of old pictures. Old pictures, nursery rhymes, ancient old nursery, nursery rhymes. rhymes. It creates a pressure point on this time corridor, like worn fabric, they say. And at that point, there are, are things, about the best description we get, things, monsters that live out there that can sometimes break in and take things out and it's senseless and purposeless and it has no they have no understanding of what it wants or what it does it just simply is essentially chaos and the implication is they and 115 others well they 115 of them are all that stand between now and normality and these things from breaking in it's it's and as these things break in the echoes and are the ghosts that they see and the manifestations of uh it, it's and people disappearing i mean that we're we're, we're led to uh, believe at this point that's what causes the disappearance of the parents it's right. these things that are trying to creep through uh, the, the weakened wall of, of the space-time continuum. Right. They've just reached in and, and plucked the parents out. It, it's, an, it's an interesting idea, and because they don't explain it any better than that. I mean, my explanation sounds pretty lame, but... but that's, that's pretty much what they say. But that's I mean, that, their that, that's, explanation, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty much, that's pretty much it. I remember I had to, uh, in order to wrap my brain around it, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these poor sci-fi junkies that likes to have everything, you know, nice and neat, organized and stamped in a box, uh, so I can full, so I can readily identify. I'm really not big on nebulous definitions, and, I, and so I had to watch that several times before I could finally comprehend what it was that they were trying to say. I think it could be said a little bit better, but for the sake of the show, I think it worked. I think this is a lot like uh, some of the latter. Uh, we make fun of the timey-wimey but in Doctor Who, but I think that it, it's the way that Steele ex- explains it, <clears throat> where he is basically saying, it doesn't make any sense to you, but this is just the way it is. Kind of like quantum physics. You know, it doesn't really matter whether it makes sense to you in your little mind. It just simply is the way it is. Well, I, I think also the fact that um, everybody else lives in uh, – well, I don't know if I, don't know if I want to say a fixed point in time. But no, you don't want to say they can't, Yeah, no, I, can't, I don't want to say that. But they, they don't move um, – they, they they move with time. They you know everybody else just doesn't um, 
move forward or backward with the kind of freedom that sapphire and steel can. So clearly uh, they are able to view time from a completely different perspective. And I think this is a clever writing gimmick. Uh, it By going along this this avenue, it allows the writer to not have to really define what it is that they're doing or how they do it. You can just simply go by the premise that you are, by your very, the na- very nature of your existence, incapable of understanding what it is that we do. Right. So therefore, that's it. Right. That's, that's, that's basically it. That, that, is the, that is the fundamental premise. These people are on a different people, things, whatever they are. They are on a different level than we are. Now, one of the things that they point out that, as you heard in the opening uh, narration, they talk about the different uh, elements that can be used and that you can't use the transuranic elements. And yet half of the ones or more than half of the ones that they name, including sapphire and steel, <laughs> they're not elements. They're not elements. So, I mean, this is, I think this is just generally poor understanding of what what the term is, but it's, it imp- the implication is that these things aren't just higher beings. There's an implication that they are part of the natural order of the universe. Yes. And you know, I think that, I can, that, that are sentient on some level. Yes. That they somehow have, have, a, have a sentience and are trying to write right the wrongs. Um, so whether or not they're actually human beings as we understand them, I have no idea. I don't think we're really meant to fully understand. I, I, well, as I watched it, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the argument could be made that they are um, intelligent forces of nature that have been given human form. Uh, I, I, in fact, that's the kind of theory that I go with, that in order to be able to interact with life, uh, they're, they're given some kind of human form and the very base, the, the very nature of the, the transuranic el- elements prevents them, those, those remaining 12, from being able to do that. And they're radioactive. That's, how, that's what I got out of it, at least. Yeah, it, it's definitely, and you know, is there someone assigning them? Is it? Is it natural that they just show up? Uh, is it? I don't know. We're not. We're really not going to find that out. I, I, I think I can. I think I can safely give that spoiler away. We're really not going to figure out where sapphire and steel come from, uh, but we will learn some more about their their nature as time goes by. One of the things I thought was kind of very interesting plot wise in the story, and I don't know how you feel about this, but have you ever? been watching a show like a Friday the 13th or something and you know that the person is doing something incredibly stupid and and you like, yell at the television as they're doing it basically <laughs> yes. yes it's like do not open up the big cupboard <laughs> you know, in the whatever you do do not open that red door that's right. <laughs> and uh, it's, it will disturb the rainforest. <laughs> In this episode of Sapphire and Steel, throughout the whole episode, Steel, who is a bit nasty. I mean, he's, he's not a very likable guy. He sort of lives up to his name, Steel. And that's meant to be. And, you know, Sapphire is pretty but hard. And, and she is... She's, She's not exactly nice either, but she disguises it better. She's yes. more diplomatic, but at times you can tell she's not really any different than Steel. Especially in the very beginning of the story. She she does come across that way. Yeah. And um, so the boy is slowly trusting them. The daughter is young enough she just kind of trusts Sapphire to begin with. But the boy's a bit older, and he has more and more trouble tr- he, he, coming to terms, and he realizes that they really are trying to help. And it goes on. And then the creature copies his father, 
or one of the creatures, copies his father and comes out and reveals himself to the boy and tries to get the boy to help him basically break down the barrier so more of them can come through. And the boy is a bit suspicious. And his father, when he holds his father's hand, he's like frozen like ice. And, you know, these are all things that we as the audience are watching. It's like, hey, stupid kid, that's not your dad. Especially after all the warnings that Steele, well, actually that both Sapphire and Steele had given him, that they would try to trick any him. means necessary to get out, which means there'd be a lot of trickery going on there. So he'd been given plenty of warning. And yet when he, at one point when he thinks he hears his mother's voice mm-hmm. coming out of the, that bedroom to open the door, he's, he's about to. And he swears up and down, that's my mother. And Steele says, no, no, that isn't. Your mother is not in there. Yes. But but what I was getting at is that, oddly enough, even though you do kind of scream at the TV and go, no, no, that's not your dad. If I were a kid that age, that would be a really hard I think, it's, I think it's a very good portrayal of the boy. Even It was a very we, honest one. As we come off and think, well, yeah, you're being kind of stupid because obviously you're in a science fiction story and these are aliens. It's like, but if you tried to put yourself in the situation of this boy who his parents have disappeared mysteriously, these two weird people come up. And even though they seem to be trying to help you, when your dad stands in front of you, it's – yeah, no, no person in in reality is going to think. No, that's a trick of the transporter that split the captain in half, or whatever it happens to be. You're going to think it's your dad because, yeah, nothing especially, could trick you that effectively. Especially when you consider, I mean, it, 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 if the stories were taking place today. Uh, it's very possible that maybe someone that age would have more suspicion. In this age of uh, information technology, uh, just the nature of the of way science is, and, and the nature of our, and the nature of community as, as we are. But in that time, I mean, think about it. This is 1979. Um, they were living with no phone. Yeah, they had no telephone. They had a radio. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they did. And, and I think. And I think there was a. I think there was a turntable. I think, but they really didn't have a lot of um, technological uh, advancements, even that, that that were even present in that time. They were very isolated. So, to this boy, his parents were literally the world, and. When that kind of security blanket gets yanked away from you, heck yeah! If your dad shows up, you're gonna want to believe. You're gonna, gonna want to say, "But that's my dad." And no matter how suspicious or how many warnings you've been given, there's that part in you that's gonna say, "But that's my dad." Yeah. So yeah, in many ways, his his response to some of these things, especially in the beginning of the story, were very much on target. He does. Um, I, I had noticed that as the story does go on, he does get a little, a little wiser, yes. a little smarter, only because of experience. But it's you know it's later in the story when his fake dad shows up. But I mean that's really a, a you know fake voices coming from across the door and and strange lights and one. But but actually have your dad stand there after being missing and say, "I'm back, son." Oh yeah, I was just I was hiding behind the sofa or whatever his mm-hmm. silly excuse yeah. was. But. Uh, you know, it, it just it tricked all of his it tricked all of his things that he'd learned, and and rightly so, I think. Uh, I could see how he might be suspicious, and he wants to tell Steel and Sapphire, and his dad's like, "No, don't tell them; they're the bad ones." And you know, ugh, that that would be it. That would be it. Some of that age, yeah. What I mean, that's yeah. He. he he doesn't have the um, the, the faculties, the, the the emotional development to be able to make uh, a really good decision. I mean, yeah, I would have fallen for it too. Sure, I you know I'd have a hard time, honestly, if 
you know, my wife turned up, disappeared, and and then she showed up. I mean, it it would be so hard to envision that it could possibly not be her when it right standing that you'd have to be doubtful. Of course, I mean, you, when you have that kind of emotional investment, you, I mean, just it, you naturally would. You, you just couldn't. You couldn't not, because you know, evil twins don't exist. Replicants don't really exist. We we know it's fantasy on television, even though we may love it and like it. But if it were presented to you in front of you, standing in front of you, right in three dimensions and touchable, you you couldn't deny your senses. Right, and to this kid, uh, he again he. He had never seen anything of this nature before. It's not like he was uh, a focal point for these kinds of activities for, for many years to the, to the point where he had some kind of awareness as to how it all worked. This was the very first time he'd ever experienced anything like this. So to him, yeah, the natural inclination is, I, I want to believe it because it's my dad. I mean, it looks like my dad. It sounds like my dad. I kind of want to say that's my dad. I mean, that's that's the natural behavior. Exactly. We won't give away a whole lot more about the story. Safe to say that there is there are these ghostly beings trying to cause mischief and trying to break through and uh, and whatnot. It's a very it's a it's a good ghost story without quote unquote real ghosts. It it's it's Sapphire and Steel's universe version of the ghost. Uh, and in that case, it's a very effective story. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is the the production values of this program. Um, again, to draw a comparison to Doctor Who back in the late 70s, uh, Doctor Who is uh, considered to be pretty low budget. Yeah. <laughs> but it looks like a big budget extravaganza compared to Sapphire and Steel. Um, it's Sapphire and Steel. I think they're probably using a set from a different TV show, uh, and there it was shot on videotape, right? And there's not much, uh, there's not much in the way of special effects, and many of the special effects are practical effects, and and that for the for the sake of the un- uninitiated on terms in television, a practical effect is is one that's actually done. Uh, while filming. While filming. That's right. So many of, for example, the creatures in many instances are flashlight, little spot on the ground, you know, being moved around, a little light, um, because we're never really given the full nature of these creatures. Um, but it's done. It's very effective. I think. I thought it, it worked. It all worked for me. I had no problem with it. And because we were talking about um, ghost stories, it makes it. I, I don't know quite how to say this. Um, you're more it, it, as as a producer, you want to create something that's more atmospheric and less flash. So. You're not really required to come up with really spectacular visuals. I mean, the most spectacular visual they, they, they do is some form of double exposure in some way so that you saw what would what, what appear to be the ghosts or the echoes in time walking through and you, sometimes you would see through them. Right. Yeah, they, they were slightly translucent. And they do a little bit of stuff with uh, sapphires, eyes glowing blue and uh – steel freezing some things but for the most part it's it's done with just clever camera work yeah um and and like i say it works but it definitely does not have the look or feel of a modern program uh if you're expecting something like you would get today it 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 has the feel of of a long time ago and, and it's funny that you should say that because, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, I didn't realize that this this TV series um, ran from seventy nine to eighty two. As I was watching it, I honestly thought I was looking at something that maybe was dated around seventy six to seventy seven. It really had a mid seventies feel to it. So to, to, to find out that it was done seventy nine to eighty two was very very surprising. I mean, at that point, we're just years away from 
you know, like Star Trek The Next Generation, you know, where, where science fiction shows were already beginning to develop a slightly glossier and slicker look. That so, was 79. Yeah. Yeah, Star Trek: The Next Generation, or Star Trek: The Motion Picture. It's Star Trek: Motion Picture, but I'm talking about television shows. Yeah. Now, I would have put the show more if if you'd shown me an episode, and if I didn't know who Joanna Lumley and David McCallum were, because I can look at Joanna Lumley and say she's older than when she was in the New Avengers, but she's obviously still young and and hot. Unlike she's she quite was beautiful in, when she was an absolutely fabulous. She was absolutely. Not <laughs> creature, but um, and and that's why they cast her in that show. I mean, partially th- her portrayal, but because she was a glamour, uh, she was very glamorous. Um, and and I think, if I'm not mistaken, on the uh, alternate election night coverage on, uh, I think it was ITV during the recent British elections. I believe that in right they did a write-in thing to who would win prime minister. I believe it was Joanne Lumley. <laughs> she's very popular. Um, you know, she does a lot of charity work. Uh, she's she does some travelogues. Uh, she, she's remained she's remained popular for many years. Um, but that's deviating from topic. But I I would have so I could have looked at the picture and said, you know, this must be after the New Avengers, which I think we determined was seventy six, seventy seven. But. And obviously, uh, David McCallum looks much older than he did when he was Ilya Kuryakin, which was back in the in the sixties. I would have pegged this show at late sixties videotape. Um, it reminds me a lot of of Dark Shadows. Yes, uh, which is you know similar studio bound uh, videotape standing sets kind of kind of thing mm-hmm. with practical effects so i i would have so it definitely has a feel of a much older program and the pacing of the program is it's much slower it's much slower part of it is it's deliberately slower uh because of the i think that builds atmosphere in this particular kind of ghostly story and part of it is because as a six-part episode i think they've padded it out uh, a bit too much uh, particularly the the reprise at the beginning of the next episode is particularly long on some of the episodes. And I would have guessed they could probably trim a whole, they could probably trim a whole episode out of it without losing a whole lot. And that, not- well, they might, there may have been a contract with the network or the production company to make X number of episodes. So the best way to do that, well, if we overlay a little, if we overlay like maybe five, five, seven minutes here, another five or seven minutes here, we can stretch it out. Yeah, right. So it, it might, it might have been production reasons why they did that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it, I'm sure it was. Uh, that's you contract out, you say six episodes, you do six episodes, and and. Sometimes the, you know, sometimes uh, there's a rule of thumb basically that in a shooting script, uh, one page is one minute, roughly, and but that is just a rough guide. When you're writing a when you're writing a script, you're if you need a 27 minute episode, you write a 27 page script. But sometimes the descriptions can cause it to run longer. You know, like if if you've got narrative descriptions, says you know, so and so runs over to the building and climbs to the top of the building, jump. You can get a lot done. Whereas if it's a lot of dialogue, it takes up more page time. So sometimes when they start working on the episodes and they get it all laid out and you and you and you film it, uh, it doesn't run quite 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 as long quite as long as you thought that it or might too run. long or too long or yeah. too long. Just it. Those are the vagaries of uh, of the production system um but i want to i want to i want to further address what you were saying about the slower pacing um go ahead this was something that was uh, the slower pacing of the storytelling this was something that was very common uh or a lot it, it it was more prevalent um back in the late 70s mid to late 70s it was far more prevalent you know and i don't want to you know, divert you know or go off back into the doctor who tangent but if you were to take uh, Doctor Who episodes that were done over the last couple of couple of seasons versus the Doctor Who episodes that were done 
uh, if, if, if you really want to talk about extremes, you know, start looking at the late 60s. And, yeah, you know, the storytelling was much slower. I think it would – I don't know if it has something to do with the attention span of the television viewing audience. Perceived attention span of the television viewing audience. I, I think this is one of the disservices that modern uh, production companies do. I know that when they brought – Doctor Who back, Russell T. Davies, specifically out and out said, kids today simply wouldn't watch multi-part Doctor Who. And I think that's an insult. Well, possibly, but I, I think what he was getting at, um, there's something that I've been... That, that, I, that I've talked uh, a lot about uh, on my own, is that because of... <laughs> no, with my partner. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Uh, something that, that we've noticed is that because we live in such... Um, and an information delivery society, I mean, with, with technology, computers, the web, email, all these things, information is available to us just like that. So the concept of having to wait for something, uh, especially for today's odd, today's people, is, is, it's a foreign concept. You mean I have to write a letter and stamp it and wait three days for it to reach the person I want to contact and then wait another three days maybe for them to reply. So th- this idea of having to wait is something that we don't we, – we're just not accustomed to today. But it was it, – it, that's just the way society was. You know, Back you know, at the time, they were making these television shows. So I think the – I, I don't think they were trying to deliberately tell a slower story. It was just the natural thought process. If you want to get into the if, – if this were a political podcast and you wanted to get into that nature, uh, I, I'll take the momentary to think that – think about all the stuff that people tell you about how our country was set up and what it was all meant to be. And think about the fact that those people 200 years ago didn't have a clue what telegraph was. Exactly. Let alone the fact that I could be in Washington D.C. in four hours if I really needed to. You know, the the world has truly changed, and it's been accelerating at a much greater rate. And we do have to think differently. But I think it's I think it's wrong to say that people, kids, cannot. Uh, you know, that's like saying, well, you know, kids today couldn't enjoy Shakespeare. They couldn't enjoy Hamlet. Well, that's just not true. But if, if you it's keep, presented right, yes, they can. If you keep telling them that they can't appreciate then they won't. Them, then they won't. And if you keep saying, well, you guys wouldn't watch a six-part stuff, I say, no. Sit down and watch it. Don't try to watch the thing back-to-back. It wasn't meant to be watched back-to-back. It was meant to be watched as kind of like comments. Com- Come back each week to the cinema and see Roy Rogers in The Lost City or whatever in installments. It's it's the television equivalent of a serial. Yeah, it like the old serial. Flash Gordons. That's a different style of storytelling, and it's meant to keep you coming back, and it's meant to keep you interested. And it does have to do some things like go over ground again, uh, which – watching it back to back seems incredibly tedious but there is something in the anticipation i think that makes it interesting yes i like my instant gratification uh, as quickly as the next person does but at the same time i can appreciate the other forms maybe that's because i'm old but my well, I think in the will watch yeah, this I, stuff. Yeah, I, I think in in terms of you know the the, the Doctor Who stories back then and and Sapphire and Steel that we're talking about now. One of the reasons now maybe maybe because I am older. I mean, I'm I'm 49, so maybe I I grew up in that era where I'm used to the slower storytelling, and maybe I favor it like a covered wagon and the oh, things. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Uh, but. What I thought really was interesting about Sapphire and Steel is that at the very at, at, at its very core, it was a well told story, and it doesn't. I don't think it really matters who is watching it, regard, you know, regardless of age. If you present something, okay. So if you're going to present it in installments, if you present it to them in a really good package, 
Yes, you could still break it up over several weeks. You could still break it up into a four-part or six-part story, and they will keep coming back. So you're right. Uh, I think Russell was uh, – there was something of a disservice by saying that the young people of today wouldn't be able to sit through something like that. I think that's rubbish. If you, if you give them a really well-told story, they will watch it. That's it. that's what needs to be done, and and I think it's a shorthand when we say, well, we'll just get in, get out quick, and they won't have time to lose their attention. And you're losing something in the story at the same time, because I, I think like that once kids ha- and characterization, y- yes, that too. But I think also it allows you to really develop. Again, I'm going to go back to uh, this this Sapphire and Steel episode, atmosphere. It was a very atmospheric episode. It was very creepy at times because it it is essentially a a ghost story of sorts. Had this been told like Doctor Who is today, it would not have worked. It would have gone by too fast. You would have had too much story to tell. Even if you were abridging it, you would not be able to really create that spooky feeling that that you really want to try and create because we're watching this story through the kids' eyes essentially. And it's a fear of danger. Right. We're seeing this from their point of view. So it needs to be a little eerie. It needs to be told at a slower pace. And to take the time to slowly just pan across the house for really no reason at all, but to help create atmosphere, I thought is a really, really great technique. And it helps sell the show. Yes. Yes, I, I I do think this is a. Um, I, if it wasn't a clear, I think this is an excellent show. It's it's strange. It's not even in the category of what would be typically have been brought across from England to the United States for syndication. Like I said, I don't think it ever it ever aired over here. Um, but it's a program worth watching. Um, and you know this is this is an opening episode, and it gets better. There are better episodes ahead. Uh, so I guess as, as in conclusion, I'd say stay to. I'd say try it, and I'd say stay tuned and, and watch for some more episodes and get the feel for it. It's certainly what we're going to do because I'm going yeah. to make Ben watch all of them. And something that we did, we actually did not watch necessarily all of it in one night. Yeah, I don't think you should. No, in fact, it it was kind of fun for me to be able to – I mean, now we we, we watched it over the course of several nights in a row as opposed to waiting a whole week as when uh, the show originally aired. But still, there's that sense of anticipation, which I'm told is half the fun. Well, so I like to, it, it was it was, it was I, I I'm very much enjoyed being able to say I mean okay yeah I had it all on DVD I didn't care it's like you know what I can't wait to see what's going to happen next you know, you know put the DVD away and then all that day you know the very next day at work I'm thinking I I really am very curious to sit down and see where this goes tonight there's something to be said about Giving yourself time, you know, uh, see each episode, or if you really want to be a purist, watch an episode every every week. Watch watch an installment every week, as opposed to you know one a night like I did. But still, I I, I think it's I, I think it 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 does a lot more for the show, and and I think you'll get a lot more. You, you'll get greater reward as a viewer if you were to do it that way, because one of the neat things about. Uh, Seeing it in installments like that is – it gives you the opportunity to think, what the heck did I just watch? <laughs> what was that that I just saw? How will Sapphire get out of that picture? Yeah. <laughs> will Steel ever thaw out? Yes. Will that kid ever shut up? <laughs> will yeah, – but- does she know any more of those nursery rhymes? I particularly liked the, the premise that the nursery rhymes, these ancient nursery rhymes, were what the trigger were. Was trigger was was the trigger? It was, those were the triggers, and that was the trigger. Those were the <laughs> triggers, uh, and that you know they could try to do everything they could, like tear them out of the books and burn the books, <laughs> but the girl knew them. 
she had them memorized and she liked them. And if she would recite them, they had problems. Well, and it wasn't just that, uh, you know, not to give away too much, but they were able to uh, install uh, a nursery rhyme into the mind of the brother. Yeah. To the point where he couldn't help but recite it. That's when the, yeah, when the creatures were trying to, getting stronger and trying harder to break out. Uh, exactly. Because they were learning. They're so alien from us. They don't think like us, but they learn. And that was, uh, you know, it also makes the threat a little bit more credible as it goes on. So they're, they're really quite simple at the beginning of the story. But by the end of the story, their attacks are quite advanced. Which makes that, which increases the danger, which again, really comes, it goes back to the great storytelling and the great pacing. It, it, Builds the anxiety and the nervousness that uh, you, the viewer, would get watching it like that. So, it, I, I, I don't know what else to say except that I think it's just it's a it's an excellent, excellent. It, it's a very well packaged TV show. Yeah. Well, uh, next time on Fusion Patrol, uh, we will either be reviewing the second story in Sapphire and Steel. Or we will be reviewing something else. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure yet. We're not sure yet. I don't know whether whether we should take, uh, and I'll take feedback from the from the crowd as well. If if anybody would like to uh, look for us, uh, uh, by the way, incidentally, we do have a, a new Facebook page. You just basically have to search for us. Uh, look for Fusion Patrol. Find the page. Uh, we're still kind of getting geared up as to what we're doing for it, but uh, it turns out we have to have 25 people to say they like the page uh, so that we can then get the username Fusion Patrol for the page. It's kind of an odd... It's uh, a catch-22. It's a catch-22. If nobody can find you or doesn't look for you, I, I, the link to it is really ridiculous. It's got numbers and... Uh, so uh, if you're out there and you, uh, you want to help us out, try that. But we haven't really decided whether we just want to barrel through Sapphire and Steel in a one episode per episode or whether we want to break it up because, whereas I like Sapphire and Steel, but there's a bunch of other programs. And I don't want to get into that mode like we were with Doctor Who where – we just had episode after episode after episode of the same thing, even though, well, we thought it was interesting anyway, um, and it was timely. But, you know, we're we're all over the board. We, we've got lots of other shows that we want to talk to you about and and have a conversation. So, and, uh, if, and if anybody out there has a suggestion for a show to, talk, to have us talk about, by all means, speak up. Yes. Yes. Please not Battlestar Galactica, the new series, though. Please no. Not, not that. <laughs> Anything new, there's probably been 57,000 podcasts done on it already. But yeah. you know, I, I suspect there aren't too many. No, I bet there's probably 50 podcasts that have done Sapphire and Steel, too. But there's nothing new under the sun. But nonetheless, that's, uh, that's where we're going. It makes it more interesting for you because you won't know what we're going to do next week. It makes us more interesting for us because... I'm not going to tell Ben what we're going to do until next week. Oh, great. So, <laughs> so just uh, you know, watch that big stack of DVDs that we've kind of got lined up, and uh, we'll pick one at random. And Makes it hard for me to prep. Yes, yes. And, and, <laughs> and it shows. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I apologize, Ben. Ben actually does prep very hard. Uh, in fact, more than I do, probably. So... Uh, in any case, until next time, we hope you will join us again. And for me, Eugene, and Ben over there, yes, we will say au revoir. You've been listening to the Fusion Patrol podcast. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at feedback at fusionpatrol.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Fusion Patrol. Or look for us on Facebook. Fusion Patrol is a production of Lone Locust Productions. Our theme music is Fight the Future by Amber Wolf.
we will say au revoir. Oh, I, th- I like that. We, we haven't figured out how to say to sign off the show. I think au revoir would be good. It's sort of continental. I think it's sort of <clears throat> French or German or something. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. That's French German? French German, yes. <laughs> it's Furman. It's Furman. <laughs> and we will not say goodnight. So, no. So, Furman, no. Auf Wiedersehen. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>